Frank Liga, LAPD officer from 86 to 2014, detective uh, from 94 to 2014, working narcotics primarily my whole career. Eight o'clock in the morning, I responded to a shooting range in Santa Clarita, where I qualified with a Benelli shotgun until noon. I left uh, the shooting range and hooked up with my team in North Hollywood that were conducting a rolling surveillance of a methamphetamine dealer who supposedly had a clandestine laboratory somewhere in North Hollywood or West Valley. The plan was that uh, this female was going to uh, provide a sample of methamphetamine to a UC. Actually, it was, an, it was an undercover officer, it was an informant. We had an, a confidential informant involved in that case. And my job was to watch the deal go down. We were there until four o'clock in the afternoon. It never happened, which is not unusual. At four o'clock, we called the UC in and um, broke. At that point, I uh, turned and was heading back to Hollywood Division to our office to regroup, to set up for another case that evening. So you're driving in a, uh, an unmarked... 1990 Buick Elite Regal White, un unmarked, uh, no lights, no siren, had a, equipped with a radio system, it had a floor mic, and the microphone itself was in the visor over the left shoulder, off the left side of the windshield. Well, I was alone, but my whole team was responding, responding back to Hollywood. We cleared the investigation, and we were going to regroup back in Hollywood and start another investigation. Uh, I was leading the pack going back to... Uh, Hollywood, which consisted of driving eastbound on Ventura Boulevard to southbound on Cahuenga. I was stopped at a red tri-light at Lancashire and uh, Cahuenga. Uh, a few seconds later, I hear rap music. I look to my left, there was a green Mitsubishi Montero, uh, male black with a green jogging suit, sun zips to his chest, and he was looking at me, or looking in my direction. I assumed at the time that he was looking at someone on the sidewalk. So I turned my head and looked at the sidewalk and no one was there. So he's still looking at him and looked staring right at me. So I rolled my window down and I said, can I help you? At which point he responded, ain't nobody looking at you, punk motherfucker. Roll that window up, I'll put a cap in your ass. So he's just staring at you for no reason? Just... Yeah, just staring at, staring at the driver's window for no reason at all. He didn't feel like he'd been cut off or was nothing? Not that I'm aware of. I was just stopped in traffic and he pulls up alongside of me. And when he said, ain't nobody looking at you, punk, punk, motherfucker, I'll put a cap in your ass, that never happened to me before. I mean, I'm not a big, super tough, violent kind of guy, but I, I did look like an Aryan Brotherhood. I have a big mustache, long black hair and a ponytail, wearing a marijuana cap. The only thing I lacked was a lightning bolt on my neck. And I'd never had a one-on-one -on -one contest where somebody said that to me like that. And I'm going, I, I, I said, excuse me? And after I said, excuse me, then the gang signs came out. Obvious blood gang, gang signs. I'll put a cap in your month, and, he, and we went on. So uh, I went, okay, let's go, right? With no intent to fight him. But I said, let's go, verbal judo. I don't know if you recall verbal judo. We all took verbal judo, how to deescalate something. And so I says, let's go right here. Let's do it now. Because at the time, in, in the, the late 90s, the gang members, the South End gangs were, were transitioning from Monte Carlos. They had the 70s Monte Carlos with the big fenders. They were tra transitioning to SUVs. And the common pr practice was they'd pull somebody over in traffic and basically just cut them off and block them off, and they'd jump out of the car and attack them. And I didn't want that to happen. So I said, let's go. Do it right here. So the light turned green. I pulled forward. He pulled in behind me, and we went through the intersection. He pulled right to the red zone and stopped. And I drove right away. And I'm watching him in the mirror, and he was on the steering wheel, and he was doing one of these deals. It looked like he was going to rip the steering wheel off. And I'm laughing at him. I'm thinking, what an idiot. I think I'm going to stop. But it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Cahuenga on a Tuesday afternoon, and traffic sucks. And the three lanes of traffic were backed up. We get to the next light at Regal Place. There's a uh, gas station on the, the northeast corner. Business is on the northwest corner and there's a freeway on-ramp. Well, when I got there, I was about four cars back. The number one car in the left turn lane blew the red light, got on a freeway, which is not a big deal. The car's been forward. 
The number one car in the number one lane blew the red light and got on a freeway and the cars move forward, leaving a space open for me right next to me. And I'm watching in my mirror and he's coming. He broke traffic and was literally going in the northbound lane. He's going back and forth in the lanes, weaving through traffic and he's coming. I was on my radio saying, hey, guys, I got a problem. I got a black guy in a green Jeep up here, might have a gun. I need help, thinking it's coming. So again, knowing that gang members had a history of jacking people in cars, I'm not going to be locked in my car. So the first thing I did is unhook my seatbelt. I took my Beretta 9mm out of my holster and put it in my lap facing the driver's door. And I'm watching him in the mirror talking on the radio. Hey, guys, I got a problem. This guy's coming up fast, might have a gun. When the, Where are your team at this point? And do you know? Half a mile, probably, turns out. They were, we were all coming back from uh, Vineland, basically Vineland and Ventura. And he, he pulls up alongside of me, because when, when, when that car pulled forward and leaving a space next to me, I remember saying to myself, shit. And he pulls up alongside of me and slams to a stop, and the truck actually jerked, and he comes across his body with a stainless steel pistol. Turn, I thought it was a forty-five. He leans across the pasture seat like this here and screams, I'll cap you, motherfucker. And I wasn't really afraid of him. I can't say I was afraid of him, but I had no control over my body. You know, you know, you understand what I'm saying? It's like if somebody throws a baseball, fast baseball, you're going to do one of these deals. Well, I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't control what I did. I know I couldn't go back because I'm in the front seat of my car. I had the seat. I couldn't go to the right because... It's still in line of fire. I couldn't go to the left because I'm at the door. The only place I could go was forward. So I went forward, hit my chest on the steering wheel, took my foot off the brake, and I bridged the gap between me and the car in front of us, which is about three foot, four foot. And as soon as I bridged the gap, I kind of recovered fairly quickly, and I came up with my gun. Here's the door frame, my window. I came up with my gun over my shoulder backwards, and as soon as I cleared my window frame, I fired around. Bang. I saw a glass break. And that threw me off because I'm thinking, How I couldn't believe I missed. I know the passenger window was down. The front passenger window was down. I know that. And I saw glass break. And I saw, when I saw glass break, what I saw was, was glass shards bubble, blow up, boom. So I'm like this. And I thought I shot the rear passenger window out. So I actually turned to my left even more and looked at the, looked at the passenger window consider because I couldn't believe I missed. And I came back on him. And he was the same as me. When I fired the first round, it went through his door, the dryer, the passenger door, mid, right in the middle of it, through the door and hit, a, hit the glass that was down, and the glass shattered and went through. He did the same thing I did. I can't say he was afraid, but he reacted the same as I did. I went forwards, I had no place to go. I shoot that window out. He knows rounds are coming. His arm is like this here. He turns to his left and goes to the corner trying to get away from the the thing. Well, I come back, his arm is still extended with the gun still pointing at me. I adjust and pull back and I fire the second round. According to forensics and according to the video recreation they did, the first round and the second round were the exact same traje trajectory. The first round, had I had the first round raised up eight inches, I'd have killed him on the first round. But the first round, when I came over, it was leaning down, and I shot through the passenger, the passenger door. And then I readjusted and pulled back. He went from straight arm, his arm went from here to the steering wheel, like this. No, it didn't retract. It, it just went from here to here. So they asked me what happened to the gun. I said, I have no idea. When I shot the second round, I knew I hit him because I heard the round hit him, the thud. And I could see it in his eyes. His eyes got real big. And his right arm went right to the steering wheel. And he accelerated. By that time, the light had changed to green. And all the cars in front of us, like I said, I was four cars back. All the cars in front of us have left. So when he pulls forward, I'm like this here. And I follow him with my eyes. And I'm on the radio. Hey, I just shot this guy. I need help. And I'm reading the license plate off because I'm thinking I'm going in pursuit. As I'm watching him, I put the gun away. He gets to the mid, mid about 35 feet into the intersection and stops and does a U-turn. So I'm still sitting there. Okay, so I go, all right, here he's coming. We're going to joust. Okay, here we go. So he's coming back toward me. And as he's coming back toward me, he's pumping his right arm. His right arm is 
in this motion here. And he's got the stupidest grin on his face I ever saw. And, he, and I think, okay, here we go. So I pull my gun out again, and I'm waiting because we're gonna, I'm going to shoot him when he goes by. If we, we're going to have a gun for rolling gunfight. I'm going to let him have it again. He gets right even with me. He makes a right-hand turn, 90-degree turn, into the gas station parking lot. When he goes over the concrete sidewalk to the blacktop, there's a little bit of a lip. When he hit that lip, in my opinion, in my impression, to me, it looked like he shut the key off on a car, on the, the truck. Because what happened is he hit that lip, and the truck just kind of went, ooh, and rolled in. They say he crashed into a Jeep, but he didn't crash into anything. He drove into the, to the building and came up, touched and touched this Jeep. It wasn't a crash. There was no damage whatsoever. But he touched the thing. I checked traffic, pulled in. I pulled in the gas station. And normally on a felony traffic stop, the police offset to the left to cover the driver going to the driver's side. In this particular case, they questioned me about this because my tactics were different. I offset to the right. And the reason I offset to the right is because I got gas pumps right here on the side, and I'm anticipating a running gun battle through gas pumps, and I didn't want to blow us up. So I offset to the right and got out of my truck, my out of car. I pulled my gun, well, as I was getting out of the car, I pulled my badge up, was around my chain, around my neck. A Hispanic fellow was coming out of the, the gas station door, and I held my chain up and I, my badge, and I go, hey, I'm a cop, call 911. And he turned around, ran back in the station. Whether he called or not, I don't know. I pulled my gun out, and I got up, and I approached the vehicle. I got to the rear, left rear quarter. Basically, his whole body, the left side of his body, was in the left door jam between the door and the post. But he was slumped to the right. So his whole body was leaning left, slumped to the right. So from where I was, I could see his empty right hand. His right hand was on his right thigh, and I could see it was empty. I had no movement, no sound, no nothing. I'm standing there screaming, police officer, let me see your hands. Police officer, let me see your hands. Nothing. As I'm standing there, just behind the passenger, the, the driver's side rear door, I see a black hood of a black car come out from behind the gas station. And it comes out, and it's a CHP car. It comes out to the windshield. It stops abruptly, and then it backs up again out of sight. So I'm standing there, still standing there, and I'm watching him, but I'm looking over the hood at the, at the chippies. And the CH car comes back and stops. It didn't come to the windshield. It came up, so I just got the hood and it stopped. And now there's two CHP officers standing, hiding behind the fender and the front fender. So I raise my badge up again, and I'm, I'm going, hey, I'm a cop. I need help. Get up here. And they're yelling, drop your gun. Oh, and they're yelling. I said, I'm a cop. I need help. But you're in plain clothes. Plain clothes. I had a baseball cap on, tank top t-shirt, right. jeans, badge around my neck, nine millimeter in my hand, and I'm in a clearly a police officer position. And I'm yelling at him, hey, I'm a cop, need help, come up here. So right at that point, we hear a horns blowing. And to my right, my, my uh, supervisor, Dennis Zoiner, we, again, we don't have lights or siren on our cars. They're all plain cars. He comes pulling into the driveway with, uh, he's got his, his hand out with his badge, left hand out the window with his badge in it. And he had a partner, a female officer who was in the passenger seat. She had her hand out the window with a badge in it, and he's blowing a horn. So the CHP officers see them, and I'm standing over here like this, and I'm watching them, and this guy's not moving. And I'm standing there, okay. And then one CHP officer kind of comes up, and it looked like Barney Fife walking kind of the, you know, and he comes up. And they'll swear to God they have their guns out and they're pointing at me and threatening me to drop my gun and all that stuff. No gun was out. He comes between my Buick and the Montero, and he gets just, just to the rear quarter, the, the passenger rear quarter of the Montero in front of my Buick. And I'm looking at him, and he says to me, are you a real cop? I says, yeah, I'm a real cop. This guy's hit bad. Take over. You're in uniform. So he comes around the corner, and I go to the low ready. And as he, he runs up, he pulls his gun out, and he runs up to the driver's door, and the other chippy comes from the car and runs up to the passenger door and points his gun in the window at the, and they're going to shoot each other. So I go, whoa, and I back up even further. So I put my, I'm at the low ready, so I backed up even further. And as I'm watching them, I get a hand in my chest that pushes me back into the gas pumps. It's my boss, the Zoiner. He pushes me back. And I go, so I, dec I put my gun away. And at that point, my team had already arrived, the rest of my squad. And we're all plainclothes detectives. They, they came running in, and uh, we had two Metro guys loaned to us. 
they came running in and they took over for the CHP. They pushed him aside and um, they opened the door. And when they opened the patch the driver's door, you could hear the Glenn gun slide against the door as it opened and dropped to the floorboard. So again, I didn't see the gun. I can't say I saw the gun. The gun was pointing at me when I shot him the second time and his arm went from here to here. My assuming, my assumption and belief is that he took his right hand and went to the steering wheel and that gun flew across the left body and hit the door and slid down and was lodged between his thigh and the door. And he drove away. And then when he came back, when they opened the door, the gun slid down to the floorboard where it was. All right. That's again, I don't I don't know. I don't know where it got there, but I know that uh, the local cops that have been harassing me for the last 30 years claim that Gaines carried his gun under the front seat of the car and that I planted it. Well, it was his duty weapon registered to him, number one. Number two, how did I plant that? And we were there immediately. Right? Yeah, and he carried it under the seat. There's no way in the world somebody's going to carry a gun under the seat loose. No way in the world. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But I'm telling you, the gun was pointing at me, and I thought it was a stainless steel. I thought 45 semi-automatic turned out to be a 9 millimeter, 9 millimeter Smith and Weston 6906 is what it turned out to be. But apparently, when you're looking down the barrel, it looked a little bigger than a 9 millimeter. So they, my team, pulled him out, took him out of the passenger door, handcuffed him. Uh, they're talking about I failed to call 911. I, you know, let him die. I told the, the Hispanic fellow in the, before I got in my car to call 911. And everybody in the Brotherhood called 911. There was cops coming all over the place. Paramedics arrived and, and worked on him. He had, when there was no blood, when they pulled him out of the van or out of the truck, there was no blood. But when they straightened him up, blood started pouring out of his body, out of his chest cavity. Because the bullet hole was two inches above his right elbow. On the, on the right side. And again, they're accusing me of executing him, that he never pointed a gun at me. Well, if he didn't point the gun at me, he'd have a hole in his arm. Because the bullet hole is two inches above his right elbow. So if his arm was where it's supposed to be, and he didn't point the gun at me, he'd have a bullet hole in his arm. He didn't. They uh, put me in the car, because the media was starting to show up and everybody. They sat me in Zorner's car, because my car was part of the crime scene. I sat in there, and then I was transported to Hollywood Station. This is about 4.30, give or take. At uh, 7 o'clock, my boss, Zoiner, and my lieutenant, Frank Valdez, came into the room I was in. I was in a cold room. We, we call it the cold room because there's a cold phone in there. And if I wasn't doing anything during the day, we didn't have a case going, I'd get on that phone and try to call dope dealers up and buy dope over the phone and hook them up. So I'm in, in that room. And they come in, and uh, Zoyner puts his arm around me. He says, you're going to have to suck this one up. I says, what do you mean? The guy was a policeman. I says, from where? One of ours. And that, at that point, I knew, holy cow, the world's going to collapse. We had Rodney King, and we just got through OJ. And now here I am. I'm going, here we go. It was. And it was. We sat there for a while, I waiting for Robert Homicide to show up and waiting for my attorney, Gary Ingemunster, to show up. And then I was transported back to North Hollywood Station where I met with Poole and Miller, Fred, Fred Miller and Russ Poole. Uh, they were assigned, Robert Homicide assigned to handle my case. That's where I, I got interviewed over there and laid the story out. And then we went back to the station, back to the gas station and did a walkthrough. One, one thing I'd like to say, people talk bad about Willie Williams. Willie Williams is dead now, I know that. But how bad Willie was as a chief. Willie wasn't that bad of a guy. He called me up at home the next morning. Yeah, Frank, this is uh, Chief Williams. Yeah, I just wanted to let you know that I'm, I, I heard about the case. I'm, I'm supporting you. He goes, I would have come out last night and given you support. He said, but with the way the media's on me right now, he says, I didn't want that, any of that rubbing off on you. And I thought that was really nice of him. I said, Willie, that was really nice of him. Um, but as it turns out, he didn't have as much power as we thought because Parks, Parks overran the whole thing and then Parks became chief and really let us have it. All right, talk about that earlier incident with Gaines that you know about where he called 911 on himself. Well, on August 16th, 1996, 
a radio call comes out, ADW, shots fired, victim down by the pool. As this, this call came out at 3.30, right at, right at roll call, shift change for PM Watch, an officer named Petty Gonzalez had just made P3, a training officer. He was assigned to a female probationer her first day out of the academy. And what usually happens, especially when you're brand new, your first day as a training officer, and you got a brand new probationer, you kind of really don't know what you're doing. And what I used to do as a training officer, even with experience, is the first day I got a brand new probationer, we'd go someplace secluded where I'm not going to be attacked or get a radio call, and I'm going to go over call car etiquette. I'm going to check their weapon. They walked around for six months with an empty gun. Is your gun loaded? All right. Here's the shotgun. Do you know how to get it out of the rack? Here's this, whatever we're doing. And that I tell them that if, if I tell you to do something, no matter what you think or do do, whether it's, you think it's right or wrong, if I tell you to do something, you do what I tell you to do at the time I tell you to do it, and we can discuss it later. But I'm in charge. And we go over the car etiquette. Well, on this particular day, Petty and his probationer get out of North Hollywood roll call and go to Mulholland up on the hill where the chances of being flagged down or run over or slim to none. And they're going over car etiquette. And five minutes later, a radio call comes out, code three run, ADW shots fired, victim down by the pool. So he goes, whoa, puts it in reverse, turns around, goes back. He's right there, iron gates, big iron gates. 15A, whatever he was, uh, request further. We got big gates, we can't get in. Call back, try to get in. Another black and white shows up over the hill, pulls in a driveway behind him. So now there's four cops, four uniformed cops in the driveway. The third car pulls up is a 1992 Mercedes uh, with custom license plate that says ITS OKIA. It's OKIA. It's OK Internal Affairs. Out pops a male black, 5'10, 200 pounds, wearing whatever the hell he was wearing, but it's the same outfit that is described as a suspect as the radio call. He pops out, this is my house. What do you want to do with my house? And he's going off the thing. Um, we got a radio call, the shots fired by the pool, victim by the pool. We got to get in there. Can you open the gates? Fuck you, you ain't going in the house. I got an expensive thing and he won't go in. He opened the gates. The third car shows up. As this is going on, a third black and white shows up, has a film crew in the back seat, LAP, Life on the Beats in the back seat. They show up. Now, there's six patrol officers there. And uh, he realizes he's not getting anywhere. So he body slams or shoulder slams Petty Gonzalez, try to initiate some kind of a, conf a physical confrontation. The cops grab him, throw him to the ground, hook him up. Now he screams, I'm a cop just like you motherfuckers. You ain't coming on my prowess. I'm a P3 just like you. I hate fucking cops. I hate the sheriffs. And he goes on a rant. They don't go in. The, they still don't go in the, in the, in the building, I, which baffles me. If I was running that show, I'd have hooked his ass up, went back to his car and pushed the clicker and went in. We still got a radio call of an ADW in progress, victim down by the pool with shots fired. It was ADW said? Assault with a deadly weapon. So they didn't know if it was true or not, but they waited uh, because he was so adamant and wouldn't let him, didn't want anybody in his property. They requested a lieutenant. The lieutenant showed up from North Hollywood and this fires me up. Uh, this, uh, this isn't in the reports, but this is factual based on speaking to the officers that were there. The lieutenant went to each officer that went in the property to check for the ADW and asked them to empty their pockets because Gaines said he had expensive things and a lot of stuff in there that was, he didn't want cops in there, he didn't trust anybody. And this lieutenant, instead of going, what are you, stupid? Basically asked the officers to empty their pockets and they went in. Now that's not written down anywhere. That's fact from, that's a statement from one of the guys that were there. They subsequently took Gaines to North Hollywood. They called a, super, a DRE supervisor, drug recognition expert, to do an evaluation on him because he's got to be high, right? Do something stupid like that. He wasn't. No, no, no sign of influence whatsoever. So now he should be assigned home. He should have been suspended, gun and ID taken away, assigned home pending this personnel complaint for interfering and in attacking officers, Failure to respond to, uh, you know, failure to cooperate with responding officers, attacking officers, all this crap. While they're doing the investigation, they pull the tape, the 911 tape. The supervisor at the 911 center, oh, that's Kevin. Kevin who? That's Kevin Gaines. 
Well, how do you know? Well, his wife works here. He, he, he calls here all the time. Apparently, he had a distinctive voice. So they did a voice analysis, and sure enough, Kevin Gaines called 911 on himself, described himself as a suspect in an ADW, and ironically, he called from a phone, bank of phone booths at the gas station at uh, Regal Place in uh, Cahuenga, about 20 feet from where I killed him. Subsequently, Gaines hired Milton Grimes, who was Rodney King's lawyer. Rodney King uh, hired Milton Grimes at Student City. And uh, Milton Grimes filed a multi-million dollar lawsuit against the city of Los Angeles for the incident that occurred on August 16th, 1996, up at Sharitha's house. And then six months later, Gaines runs into me. I'm driving, minding my own business, stopped in traffic, with the air conditioning on, lights rolled, windows rolled up, minding my business, and he pulls up and starts his crap with me. Um, the question is, did I know him? I never saw him before. Based on that, my belief, and I, I believe this is why, because Gaines had me dead. He pulled up alongside of me. I got my gun on my lap, absolutely. But I'm not like this waiting for him to show up. He shows up and I'll cap you and leans over. He had me dead, pull the trigger. How long does it take to shoot? Right? He could empty his gun. In two seconds, I could have fired 15 rounds. I fired two shots, controlled pair. He could have, he could have emptied his gun on me. Right? He, I had no place to go. He didn't do that. My belief is that he knew who I was. I'd recognize me. That's why he started the crap. And when, uh, when I drove away from it, he, he just exploded. I, I, I figured that when we were at the first contact, when I, I agreed to fight him, he pulled over. And if I'd have got out and fight him, he'd have, he'd have shot me and killed me then because he's being followed. He said he was being surveilled and an undercover cop. And the way I look, Peter just shot me and killed me right there in the sidewalk. And when I drove away, it just drove him nuts. And he chased me down, threw the gun, pointed the gun at me. And if he, his intent was not to shoot me, his intent was for me to call, call the police on my radio, call back black and whites and chase him back up to the mansion and confront him in the driveway of the, of the, the mansion again, which would have facilitated his multi-million dollar claim against the city. The last thing in his mind was the fact that I'd pull my gun and kill him. He never, I don't think he, that's why I won. I'm not that much better than anybody. I just don't get nervous. And I was in control. But he had me dead. There's no question in my mind. I was deader than hell. If you look at the, the robbery homicide, when they did the OAS report, they identified four other people that he did the same thing into in traffic. I drove away. I got stuck in traffic and he, he drove me, chased me down. And part of the problem I've had over the last 26 years or seven years is nobody believes that. I'm the white racist who hates black people. And I just randomly killed this guy. Did you see um, the portrayal of the shooting on Unsolved? Did you watch Unsolved? I did. I thought it was great. You guys did a hell of a job. I mean, I said, the reason I'm here right now is because of the second video you did that I wish would have come out 26 years ago. The deep dive episode. Yes. When I, after I got clear, it took almost two years to clear me from the shooting. Three shooting boards, which has never been done either before or after. Um, and I, I, I was demanding to the captain and the commander of LAP of narcotics, and I was demanding that they get a hold of Parks and have them put the truth out. All I wanted was the truth to come out. All they had to do was put the, what happened, like your videotape, your video, deep dive. The, the video wasn't in my favor. It wasn't against me. It wasn't for me. It was just the facts. And that's all I needed. That's all I wanted. And that never happened up until now. Johnny Cochran sued me for $25 million and um, took me to federal court because he wanted a downtown jury like the OJ jury. But the incident happened in North Hollywood, which would have made it a Van Nuys jury. He didn't want a Van Nuys jury. He wanted a downtown jury, and the closest he could get is if he filed a federal case. So he filed a federal misconduct and a murder case against me in federal court. That went on for two years, year and a half. And October 6, 1998, we're ordered to 
go to a settlement conference in West L.A. I show up, the federal, retired federal judge to mediate this conference, looking for a settlement. Johnny Cochran shows up three hours late with an entourage. They're suing me for $25 million. At the end of the first day, Cochran says he's got to leave three hours early because he's having dinner with Bill Clinton that night, President Clinton in Santa Monica. So he has to leave three hours early. They go behind the door, close doors. The judge goes in, talks to the city attorney, talks to Cochran and crew. He leaves and we're down to 800,000. So he dropped from 25 million to 800,000. Big drop. The next day we show up, we go in a SOC conference. The judge again interviews me, interviews them, goes in a closed room and we break for lunch and we go back. We come back and uh, Tom Hokinson, Jim Hahn was running for mayor at the time. He was this city attorney at the time, but he was running for mayor. So a guy named Tom Hokinson was negotiating the settlement. And Cochran says to, to, to Hokinson, he goes, can you do $250,000? $250, Hokinson's, well, it's Chief, it's Chief Parks Department. I'm going to have to notify Chief Parks and, and get back to you. We might be able to do that. And Cochran goes, well, it's, this case has been dragging on for two years. I want to get out from under it. We're, 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 we're losing money here. Okay. 20 minutes later, the secretary comes in. It's Parks. Mr. Hokinson, Chief Parks on line 20 or two, whatever it is. Hokinson gets on it. They go back in the closed room. I'm still sitting there steaming. The judge comes back out and says, and Corey comes out with his head down. The judge comes back out. He goes, okay, it's, it's over. I said, what do you mean it's over? He says, we settled the case. I says, what, what do you mean you settled the case? The only way to clear my name is to go to trial and bring all the facts out, bring the truth out. All that's going to this did this, 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 is it shows that the city's the city protected a white racist and paid him off. And then and I'm, I'm screwed. You just destroyed my life. The judge says to me, he goes, would it help if I wrote a letter? I says to him, I looked, I said, it wouldn't hurt. I says, but don't send it to me. So we close. He closed the case, settled for $250,000. Before that, though, just before we left, Cochran says, can you cut me three checks? Because the city of LA has a city charter that said any payout over $100,000 must be voted on by the full city council. Anything under $100,000, the city treasurer is the only one that had to sign off on it. Cochran says, can you cut me three checks? Hokan says, yeah, we probably do that. He wanted 90 and 90 and 70. In the letter, the judge basically writes that had it come to him for adjudication, he would have voted in favor of the city on all counts. He says the fact that the city settled, nor the amount, should in any way reflect on the conduct of Detective Liga. Detective Liga acted in accordance with all policies and guidelines throughout this whole incident. He goes, as you are aware, this settlement can be deemed political, which was big words. I mean, big words. That letter was big words. And there was a little bit more he said, and he complimented Corey Brennan on his job. And he says, oh, I listened to both sides and everybody agreed, except for me, that the, it was in, it was in best interest of the city to settle this case. They write the checks two weeks later to Cochran's office law firm. And guess how many checks they write? Twelve checks. Whoever was going to write the 90, 90, and 70 must have got a, a pitch and say, oh, geez, that's a little close to the 100,000 mark. Three checks, 90, 90, and 70 just to the same law firm right in a row. Somebody might pick that up. So they wrote Cochran 12 separate checks for $250,000. And they buried it. And it was never seen for, for four or five years. Was this the one where the city council found out and got upset about it? Yeah. When yeah. That, can you tell me about that? I don't know about that. That was three or four years later. Okay. But the moral to the story was they buried it. They settled for two fifty dollars because Cochran was a loser. The judge came right out and said that if this went to trial, he would have voted in favor of the city. That I did nothing wrong. Not only did I do nothing wrong, Corey was telling, Corey told me this was the cleanest shooting in the history of the department. Everything I said, I got complete surround sound. I basically rem remembered everything. Corey told my wife that I had the best memory recall of any officer he's ever been involved with. He said I was the best client and the worst client he ever had. I was the best because I had the best memory recall. I could remember and bring everything up. 
I was the worst because I had the best memory recall and bring everything up. He says, most cops just want this stuff to go away. You get sued, they don't want to know nothing. They just want it to go away. And I wanted to know everything right on spot. I wanted to be with, with involved in everything. And I wanted to go to trial. And they sold me out. Right now at 6, a shocking recording of a speech allegedly made at the L.A. Police Academy. And now the LAPD confirms an investigation into the circumstances surrounding that recording. Now, part of the conversation was about shooting and killing off-duty officer Kevin Gaines. Street name, Honey Oil. Veteran LAPD Detective Frank Liga interviewed about a drug case three months ago. LAPD Internal Affairs is now investigating the allegation. The voice you will hear on the following recording is also Detective Liga discussing his conversation with a lawyer about a fatal shooting. Is Carl Douglas hit me up? He says, he goes, did you intend to shoot him? I said, I hit him, didn't I? <laughs> it's asserted that the recording was made at the Los Angeles Police Academy last fall during a session at which Liga spoke to a room full of officers. And he leans forward again. He goes, you regret shooting him? I says, no, I regret that he's alone in the truck at the time. I could have killed a whole truckload of them. <laughs> and would have been happily doing it. Well, I was teaching the academy class. I've been, I've, I'm the, I was the search warrant instructor for years at, at uh, detective school and supervisor school. I taught every, every detective on how to prepare a search warrant and every supervisor on their supervisor responsibilities at a search warrant scene. And uh, three quarters of the way through, the, the class is two hours long, three quarters of the way through, a couple of officers came up to me with the book Labyrinth they wanted me to sign the book and wanted to ask questions. I said, yeah, when we're done, ask me some questions, no problem. We finished the class and I said, all right, what do you want to hear? And uh, I don't want to name names, but apparently, I got, and if you listen to the tape, the, you know, so I, I'm sorry that tape was made, but I got accused of being a racist rant with sexism and all this other crap. They determined there was no race involved in that tape. I swore. And did I, was I insubordinate calling a, a captain or a, a two sergeants incompetent and stupid? Absolutely I am. I, I did that. All right. There was no race involved. There was no sex involved. There was no homophobia involved. None of that crap. And that came out in the Board of Rights. That was all came out in the Board of Rights. But if you listen to the tape, there's no race involved at all. I think what, what rubbed people the wrong way was I would have killed a whole carload. Oh, like, what no, do no. You mean by that? Yeah, that's it. Well, that was what they were saying. Could have killed Carlo to them. I said, what I meant by that is I'm sitting in traffic, minding my own business, and I got a gang member flashing gang signs, pointing a gun at me. And at the time, I could have killed, if there was four gang members in the car pointing guns at me, guess how many four gang members I would have shot that day? All right? Got nothing to do with race. Got nothing to do with it could have been purple. Got nothing to do with anybody. I'm talking gang members pointing guns at people in traffic. And that's exactly what it meant. I could have killed a whole carload of them. And that's exactly what that was meant. Did you do anything about, I mean, because that would not have been a legal recording. Right. California is a two-party That's right. State, so did you... There was nothing no one would do. I tried, no one would do anything. I was the scapegoat. I was the racist. You know, I was the racist killer. They've been trying to get rid of me for years. Although, ironically, they're trying, you know, I'm so bad. I killed this guy in 1997. I worked till 2014, that's 17 years. Not only did I work, continue to work for 17 years, I was put in specialized units and I won federal awards. In 2012, I won the National Height Award for the largest seizure of PCP in the history of the world. Nobody's ever gonna beat that award because I got a, almost 12, 12 to 1500 gallons of chemicals to manufacture and 130 gallons of finish. That's never gonna happen again because the gangsters don't cook like that. They cook. It's pre-ordered. They cook to order now. They don't cook large scale. That ain't never going to happen again. But I've won, I won the Height Award. I won the Director Award for LA Impact. I won Officer of the Year two or, two or two times or three times. I won an award from the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Central, Central uh, District of California. I teach periodically for um, LA Haida. Like I said, I'm the national PCP expert. And I've got a a four or eight hour class I teach on manufacturing PCP for in-service law enforcement personnel. And um, some, some, some writer, journalist, contacted the director of the task force about two weeks ago 
and wanting to know if uh, they were aware that I was fired from LAPD and that I was a racist and I made racist, homophobic and all this other complaints. And the guy goes, are you crazy? And like I said, I wasn't fired from LAPD. I retired honorably. I've got a, my ID says honorably retired from Los Angeles Police Department as a detective. I have an open invitation to teach any anytime I want to all over the country. I teach all over the country periodically because you never know who you're meeting. You never know who's going on. Um, it died down, but now since Tupac is coming up in all your podcasts, I get recognized. And when I get recognized, number one, I don't know where you know me from. Do I know you from the street? Do I know you from the gym? Do I know you, did I arrest you? I, I got no idea. Um, and then there's people that, I know who you are, I know what you are, you know, all this crap. That goes on all the friggin' time. It's been going on for 20, 27 years. And he says, I was at the time, back then I was afraid of my kids. I had young kids. My son was, my oldest son was three years old and my youngest son was one year old. I was scared to death. I, I searched my truck, I checked, I, I had tape on my, on my hood, on my doors. I looked underneath my truck every night because I wasn't allowed to park on the, on the city parking lot. I had to park on the street. It, 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 was, it was tough. I go to court like I was going to the OK Corral. And then I went to, they sent me to majors to get me out of the street, which was comical. They, they didn't want me to have public contacts. So they sent me to major violators, more surveillance and more high-end high investigative. The very first case I did in major violators, I did the very first case of GHB, gamma hydroxybutyrate, in the state of California, which made big news. The date rape drug. I did the very first case in the state, which made news. And then you know, I've done a lot of, lot of high-profile cases. I put a lot of people in jail, high-profile cases. So that kind of backfired on them. But again, all I wanted to do is, let's leave me alone, let me go to work. I just... just I don't, want to, I, don't want, I don't want a lawsuit. I don't want to file complaints. I don't want to complain against anybody. I just want to be left alone and let me do my job. And if I'm so bad, I was allowed to work for 17 years in a specialized unit within a specialized unit, and I won a whole bunch of state and federal awards doing it. I told Tyndall that, that Perez and, and Mac were criminals, were crooks, based on working with them, based on watching them. He says, why didn't you arrest him? I have no proof of doing anything. If I saw him do something wrong, I'd arrest him in a second. Didn't seem to do anything wrong. They're out buying dope like we're supposed to do. The fact that uh, Perez claims to be getting robbed and Max just popped out of the wilderness, could it happen? Sure, it could happen. But, you know, whether it happened, how it happened, the way they said, I, I, I don't know. I, I got no idea. As for killing Biggie, and like you were talking just now, like you just said, gangster cops, there's tons of them. There's tons of gangster cops playing out there, whether they're real gang members or just pretending to be gang members. They're out there. The sheriff's department's constantly having issues with kind of yeah. gangs within the department. They're out there. Yeah. In my world, I worked at eight-man squad and didn't care. I, a crook's a crook. My motto was crumbs to tons. I was just as happy putting a little tiny bit of dope on the table and putting a crook in jail as putting the big giant seizures on the table. The last case of marijuana I did was 13 tons. Again, big deal. It, it, it's, it crumbs to tons. And, and the big political stuff, I couldn't care less. As long as it didn't affect me. If we're working and I said a crook's doing something that's going to screw up my career or my case, we got a major malfunction going on. But if you're out rolling around becoming, pretending to be a, a, a gangster when you're a cop, and I'm working undercover someplace, unless it comes on me, I have no idea. And as for your question about who, if I have a theory of who killed Biggie, I thought Gaines killed Biggie forever. For years, I thought Gaines killed Biggie based on the first composite that came out in the LA Times, March 10th, 1997. I looked at that composite, and everybody I know looked at that composite, so that's Kevin in a bow tie. And then the next composite was Amir Muhammad's composite, that skinny one, and I don't ever have a clue who that is. But I, up until... Uh, and I told you about Bo the Boagney deal. Up until I heard the Boagney statement, I fully believed that Gaines killed Biggie, was involved in killing Biggie. Uh, now I don't believe that. And listen to what you're talking about, interviewing these guys and that uh, Muhammad, I got no idea. 
I got no clue who did it, and, and nor do I care who did it. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if I could catch him, if I could catch him, I'd be happy to catch him for you. But it doesn't impact me. I'm retired, and it doesn't doesn't affect me.